Discrete random variables. A variable x is a random variable if the value that x takes on is a chance or random outcome of an experiment. So what we're saying here is that you'll have this variable x and it's going to contain the outcome of an experiment. The most important part of this is that that outcome is random in nature, meaning that you cannot say what it's going to be beforehand with absolute certainty. So if I toss a coin, for example, I don't know with absolute certainty that it's going to turn up tails or that it's going to turn up heads. Unless, of course, the coin has, you know, heads on both sides, but, you know, that's not a random experiment then, right? So to be a random experiment, it has to have outcomes that cannot be predicted with certainty beforehand. And a random variable just records those outcomes, right? So it records them in some coding method, right? So, for example, you may define it to be the number of heads that turn up out of a certain number of tosses. Then x will hold the number of heads that turn up. And that's an example of a random variable. Now... For that variable to be a discrete random variable, you have to make sure that it can only take on a finite number of values or a countable number of values. So in other words, they have gaps or spaces between them. In other words, what I mean by that is like you could say that, you know, there are four people in this course or there are 50 people in the course or there are 200 people in the course. But you can't say there are a pi amount of people in the course, right? When you, when you add the infinite number of possible decimals between any two numbers, that becomes uncountable, right? It becomes no longer A finite and B countable, right? So there's an infinite number of values between, say, 3 and 4 on the number line. So if you allow any fraction or decimal to be an outcome of the experiment, then you have a situation where you have an infinite set of outcomes and they're not countable, meaning that you couldn't possibly enumerate them all and count them up, right? So just as a recall of types of quantitative data, we talked about this in the beginning of the course. We said that, hey, discrete data, you should probably think of counting something up. And then the answer to that question ultimately would be a discrete response. For example, how many books do you have in your book bag? Or um, how many tickets did you get last semester, right? So when you think of how many tickets you got last semester, or how many tickets a randomly selected person got last semester, they're going to give you an answer like, I got five tickets or six tickets or no tickets, right? But they can't have pi amount of tickets. It's not possible to have those, you know, the infinite number of decimals or fractions between any two possible values. They can't achieve that. You're just counting up how many tickets they had, and it's going to be, in that case, a whole number. Now, if you think about continuous data, then it's a totally different story. And for there, you want to probably think of measurements, right? So think about volume, height, time, speed, distance, etc. All those things are going to be continuous in nature. Here's another little review here. So each of these is discrete. The number of chairs in a room, right? You'll have either like five chairs in a room or 200 chairs in a room, right? But you can't have, again, a fraction or decimal amount of chairs in the room. A uh, number of people who purchase a ticket to see a new movie. Again, you know, makes no sense to say pi amount of people purchased a ticket. Number of imperfections on a disc, right? There's going to be a finite number, certainly countable, right? When you look over here, the weight of an apple, well, that could be any fraction or, you know, decimal of a gram or kilogram, whatever you're using to measure the weight, right? Uh, length of a commute, again, any fraction or decimal mileage is, is possible, right? You could say you live 10.6 miles from campus. It makes total sense to say that. You could even live pi amount of miles from a campus, right? You could be 3.14, et cetera, miles from the campus. The height of a woman, again, same thing, any fraction or decimal there, and the volume of soda consumed, right? So you can, again, consume any amount of a liter, for example. All right, so let's kind of get into then what a discrete probability distribution provides you with. So when you think of probability distribution, think about some way to express the list of possible outcomes for an experiment and their corresponding probabilities, right? That can be expressed as a table, like the example we have on our screen here. It could be expressed in a formula, or it could even be expressed as a graph, right? So the fact is, for discrete probability distributions, we simply have a list of outcomes that are possible for the experiment, and then the corresponding probabilities for those outcomes. So in our example, we're talking about tossing a coin three times, and we're saying, hey, let x be defined as the number of heads that turn up. You could get zero heads out of three tosses. You could get one head out of three tosses, two heads, or three heads. You can't get four heads because you're only tossing the coin three times, and you certainly can't get a negative amount of heads. So this is the list of possible outcomes. You also can't have a fraction or a decimal amount of heads, right? So it's clearly discrete in nature. Now, when you look at the probability of those outcomes, we're saying, hey, the chance that when you toss a coin three times, 
you get zero heads. The chance of that happening is 0.125. We actually do this in our heads if we wanted to, because the chance that the coin turns up not a head, in this case tails, right? right? If you have no heads, you got three tails then. The chance of it being tails is 50%, right? So 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5. If we use percentages, we could do this in our head, right? So 50% times 50% is basically half of 50%. So that's going to be 25%. And then multiply that by another 0.5 or 50%, and you're going to get half of the 25, and that's 1250. So that's why it's 12.5% chance that you get zero heads. You can work out all these if you wanted to on your own to check the numbers, but they're all accurate. And so what we're saying here is that essentially we have what, the probability for each of these outcomes. So not only do we know what can occur, we know how likely those outcomes are to occur. All right. The last thing we want to talk about is certain properties that must be upheld by discrete probability distributions. So, and in fact, these are true for all probability distributions. So whether discrete or continuous, these properties must always hold. So the first one I want to talk about is the idea that all the probabilities have to be between zero and one inclusive. In other words, a probability in a probability table could certainly be zero. And it can certainly be anything between zero and one. It could even be one, I suppose, although that would be sort of, you know, a special, very unique case. But the reality is, is that it can't be over one, because over one implies more than 100% chance of it occurring, right? So 1.2 would be a 120% chance that something occurs, and that's not possible. So these numbers have to be as a maximum one and as a minimum zero. You can't have negative probability either. So if all those check out, then that meets the first requirement. The second requirement is that the sum of all those probabilities has to add up to one, right? And the reason why it has to add up to one is because if you have 100% of the outcomes, you must have 100% of the probability. If this didn't add up to 100%, then there'd have to be another outcome that's not accounted for, right? But again, if you list all the possible outcomes, you must have all the probability. And of course, all the probability, as we know, is 100% or one as a decimal.